Good morning, you're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, let's look at the headlines this morning. It's a strong start to trade in Asia with key indices edging higher. The SGX Nifty though trades a little muted. Oil prices paired gains above $70 per barrel. US President Donald Trump will announce his decision on the Iranian nuclear deal later tonight. ICICI Bank's profit halves in the March quarter with bad loans rising to nearly 10%. The private lenders board will meet again today in the shadow of the Videocon controversy. And BlackRock will sell its 40% stake in its joint venture with DSP. This will mark the exit of yet another foreign asset manager from the Indian mutual fund industry. All right, with that, let's turn to the international markets and US stocks closed higher on Monday as technology shares posted a three-day winning streak. However, the major averages closed well uh, off the day's highs after President Donald Trump tweeted that he would be announcing his decision on the Iran deal on Tuesday. Now, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle sums up all the action on Wall Street in this report. Stocks finished higher in Monday's Wall Street session, helped by a wave of M&A deals, plus the dollar rising to a 2018 high. For both the S&P 500 and the Dow, those major averages rose by about four-tenths of one percent. The tech-heavy Nasdaq leading the way up about eight-tenths of one percent. Now, relative to some of the big M&A deals on the day, Blackstone Group has agreed to buy Gramercy Property Trust in a cash deal valued at $7.6 billion, while Nestle is spending $7.2 $2 billion, almost $7.2 billion, uh, for the right to market Starbucks products. And Elliott Management has agreed to buy Athena Health for $6.5 billion in cash. So beyond those M&A movers, all of the stocks of those companies mentioned were uh, moving in a pretty big way, at least the publicly traded ones. Uh, tech was the best sector on the day, up about eight tenths of 1%, helped by lots of the well-known names, Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Facebook, and many, many others. In fact, most of the S&P 500 sectors were higher on the day. Seven of the 11 S&P 500 sectors traded higher, including energy getting a boost. Much of the day, oil trading above $70 a barrel ahead of President Trump's decision whether to exit or to stay with the Iran nuclear deal. Any sort of change could, of course, disrupt the import-export picture. Now, health care, of course, Athena Health uh, soared on the day of the possibility of Elliott Management buying the company out. But Medtronic, the giant med tech company, also sharply higher in the day, up 4.6% of the news that the company has hired a key senior vice president of strategy with the shares rallying. Investors clearly liked it. And on the day, it seemed investors liked the overall picture with stocks, again, trading higher, bonds lower. That's a risk on picture for the financial markets in the U.S. on Monday. In New York, Abigail Doolittle, Bloomberg News. All right, so tech stocks were in focus in the U.S. and particularly Apple. Uh, that particular stock is very close to the $1 trillion market cap mark. In fact, per share, it's only about 8% away from hitting that $1 trillion mark. So do watch out for that stock. Also, the international big news is the fact that President Donald Trump is set to announce his decision on whether or not to keep the U.S. in the Iran nuclear deal late tonight. Now, remember that deal essentially froze Iran's nuclear program in 2015. The announcement is set to cap more than a year of deliberation and negotiation that has at times pitted Trump against some of his closest aides and key American allies. Bloomberg's Bill Farris uh, has this report. The word we had from foreign leaders who have been through Washington in recent weeks, including the French President Emmanuel Macron and the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, was that the administration seemed to largely have its mind made up, and they were pessimistic. Those two leaders were pessimistic that the U.S. would stay in the deal. Uh, the particular timing, why tomorrow at 2, I, I don't think we have a good read on that. Um, but the president was due to make the decision by Saturday. Now, he could... Uh, he could announce that the U.S. is withdrawing from the deal, uh, and then what happens is these sanctions that he would not be waiving specifically target foreign banks that do business with Iran's oil sector. And, uh, but there's no assessment of whether companies are violating those sanctions until November 8th. So there's basically a 180-day period after the U.S. Uh, reimposes sanctions, if that's what it does, before there's a report or an assessment done of who's violating those sanctions. So in theory, we think that buys a little bit of time 
for uh, the U.S. and European governments to come to sort of, some sort of an understanding or a side agreement. But, uh, but everything we've heard to date from people who have been meeting with the administration is that um, they have not been able to persuade the White House that it's worth staying in the deal. All right, and we told you a little while back that there is positivity coming in from Wall Street, and that's essentially extended to the Asian markets as well. Uh, the Nikkei, as of now, is trading uh, a few ticks higher. It's about uh, zero point, nearly 0.2 percent higher, and uh, it seems like the Chinese benchmarks have also opened positive. Uh, we'll bring you more updates on that in just a short while. Let's go to Darshan Mehta and Agam Vakil as of now to set you up for the day's trade and also to tell you what's happening in the futures and options space in India. Darshan, the SGX Nifty indicating a very, not such a positive start and also a lot of earnings to look forward to. Yeah, so uh, Alex, uh, uh, two things. First of all, the SGX Nifty has recovered significantly from the lows of the day. It was up, down by almost uh, 30 points at one point of time. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the SGX Nifty is indicating. But uh, with uh, ICICI ADR surging and then the expected price move, I think the Nifty Bank will be something that you need to watch out for because ICICI Bank has a large weightage on the Nifty itself. Now, the SGX Nifty is indicating that probably we will come in above the 10,750 mark in trade. So there was enough traction that happened in trade yesterday. Important point is watch out how the ADR spanned out in trade. And the big move came in from ICICI Bank post the numbers and commentary and it will like, react in positively in trade today. So ICICI was up almost 4.2%. Wipro was up almost 2%. Vedanta and HDFC Bank uh, also managed to move on the positive side. Now what didn't do well? Dr. Eddie's Infosys and Tata Motors. Uh, Tata Motors over the past few days has been rather uh, uh, you know reacting negative to the news news stores that have been coming out as far as uh, crude is concerned crude continues to surge uh, uh, if you're looking at WTI WTI is about the $70 barrel per mark it's down in today's trade currently but uh, WTI is up in trade uh, Brent is trading uh, uh, is almost about the $75 $50 barrel per mark but nevertheless has come off from the highs of the day now yesterday the LME was shut so uh, these metal prices are something that you should not watch out for but look out what's happening in China currently aluminium is trading with a positive bias zinc has managed to inch up over 1% and copper is trading with a positive bias steel and iron ore are the two commodities which are not doing well on the Chinese market currently most of uh, the precious metals are trading absolutely flat in today's trade <clears throat> what happened as far as the fund flows are concerned, FI sold in almost uh, 635 crores, DI bought in 1,000 crores. So overall on the month, uh, it's even Steven, FIs have sold in 2,000 crores, DIs have bought in almost 1,700 crores in the cash market. Uh, how did the market pan out? The Nifty was up almost close to 100 points. Uh, 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 in, if you're looking at it, almost 10,700 uh, is the level. The mid caps and small cap did manage uh, to also clock in handsome gains in trade. Some of the sectors in focus the nifty pharma continues to bleed was down close to half a percent so that was trading rather weak in trade the PSU banking index did well it was up almost two percent in trade so there was traction that was happening the weeks moved up almost four percent so almost coming in close to the 14 level mark uh, is where it is now the nifty was up uh, almost 100 points up what contributed reliance ICICI bank and ITC were the major contributors for the nifty on the higher side uh, TCS as well as HDFC which have been doing extremely well uh, contributed on the negative side but Agam what are you seeing on the FNO side? Sure we saw a near 100 point surge on the Nifty and that's supposed to be a positive and uh, we've seen about a 1% increase in open interest so not too much change there uh, you know continuing the trend that we saw in the previous three or four sessions and coming down to the Nifty Bank and that is expected to be active considering ICICI bank earnings uh, will that's seen about near 14% increase in open interest even as the index of itself moves up by as much as 1%. Long is building in there. Let's see if this holds today. Uh, coming down to the Wix, again, another um, up move around 4%. Uh, now inching towards the mark of 14. So this is when, uh, you know, a lot of traders will get cautious. But we are moving into an event. So we're expecting the Wix to rise as well. That is the Karnataka elections. Uh, of course, put call ratio also edges up higher to around 1.55. And when it comes to changes in open interest, uh, well, little more base formation in the 10,500, 10,600 puts. Uh, something that we saw at the beginning. <laughs>
beginning of the series as well. Not too much to speak for when it comes to calls. Some unwinding in the 10,700 call, of course, given the fact that we moved above that mark. Uh, well, a lot of changes in stocks. So work hard moves into the ban. On the other hand, PC Jeweler comes out of the ban. Do remember the stock has gained nearly 40, 80% in the last two trading sessions. But two other stocks that I'm watching out for. Uh, well, Excite, of course, towards uh, the long side, even as the underlying moves up, along with the Maharaja batteries, which is also done very well. And OG and Financial on the losing end, uh, that's down by as much as nearly 6% and 20% added towards open interest. So a lot of stocks out there. And uh, once again, we're expecting the India WIX to rise uh, as we move into the Karnataka elections this weekend. All right. Thanks so much for that, Agam. Well, it was an eventful day in the money market yesterday. The Indian rupee fell below the 67 per dollar mark for the first time in 15 months, while the sovereign bond rallied. This after the RBI said it would buy debt to adjust liquidity. Ira Dugal sums up the development. Some relief in the bond markets. The benchmark 10-year bond deal closing down by 10 basis points at 7.62%. Friday's close was 7.72. The relief came on account of the Reserve Bank of India announcing bond purchases via its open market operations program. That announcement came late on Friday after the markets had closed. Uh, essentially, the RBI said that they would buy 10,000 crore worth of government bonds uh, in order to... Uh, take care of the liquidity situation and in view of the durable liquidity needs uh, in the future. That's the statement that came in from the Reserve Bank of India on Friday. Uh, now it came in at a time when liquidity while tightening isn't all that tight. The call money market rate has remained close to the policy rate of 6% and the banking liquidity indicators are also still mildly in surplus to neutral. So there isn't a large liquidity deficit. Uh, so the RBI coming in with these bond purchases at a time like this is being seen uh, as a step to try and control bond deals in the market. Uh, remember a whole bunch of measures have been taken both by the government and the Reserve Bank of India to try and manage yields. Uh, so first it was the government which first cut its FY18 additional borrowings. Then it came and said that it would not front load the FY19 uh, borrowings. It also suggested that the overall borrowings for FY19 would be lower than what had been put out in the budget document. When none of that worked, the Reserve Bank of India stepped in. They announced uh, that they would allow banks to stagger the hit on account of mark-to-market losses on their bond, po bond portfolio. They also eased some of the FPI limits and changed some of the FPI rules uh, in the hope that bond yields uh, would calm down a little bit. But through all of this, bond deals have dropped but then moved back up close to 770 and in the range of 770 to 775 the question is whether the decision to start open market operations and bond purchases via open market operations will actually lead to a longer term drop in bond yields. The answer to that will lie with the RBI itself and whether it decides to continue open market operations. Uh, Indranil Sen Gupta of Bank of America Merrill Lynch in a note on Monday said that he expects these uh, bond purchases to continue and account to that he thinks that liquidity in FY19 will actually be in surplus mode. Well, a lot of uh, conversations of late have been about currency and the fact that the US dollar is getting stronger and, and that has to do with a lot of trade tension around the world. Now, there's no reason why the US and China can't fix their differences and arrive at a mutually agreeable trade policy according to Jamie Dimon, who is the CEO of JP Morgan Chase. Here he is speaking to Bloomberg's Stephen Engel in Beijing. Well, I think that they're just going to know each other, and there are very, some very complex issues. And, you know, they laid out, which I think is good, they laid out what they want from the American side, and the Chinese side laid out what they want, and that's how you start the conversation. And, you know, now they're working on specific things. What do you mean by that? So hopefully they'll make progress. We, we need there to be progress to be, to be made. Do you think a trade war is possible? It's always possible, yeah. but, but uh, it's not the preference for you. I hope it's not the preference for either side. Yeah. Do you think their list of demands are too far apart, though? It's going to take quite a while. No. No? No, I, I think when you, when you go to trade, you talk about intellectual property or tariffs or you know, equity caps and where you can invest and how you protect investments. And you know, it gets into a lot of detail, but there's no reason it can't be bridged. And you know, if both sides have good faith, you know, if they don't, then it may, it may not be bridged. And you know, then you have a different economic relationship 
relationship between the United States and China. You believe there's good faith? I know Stephen Roach, formerly of your competitor, he says that the U.S. approach has been all stick, no carrot. Yeah, I, well, I don't know about that. I mean, I, like I said, the president's laid out certain issues that a lot of the business community would agree with around equity caps, into, uh, transfer of property, um, uh, non-tariff barriers. Uh, and I think the Chinese know that some of those are true, uh, but they're not going to give in to anything if they know exactly what the deal is going to be or something like that. The President Trump would also say he's got a great relationship with President Xi. They built up a bond of trust, that he wants some of these trade things fixed. And you know, our President has laid out some very tough things, but he's also negotiated. In other case, I pay a little less attention to tweets, a little more attention to what are they negotiating, what's on the ground. They did a free trade deal with Korea. Mm -hmm. you know, we negotiated it. Yes, and they're talking about, from what I hear, the term of uh, having an agreement in principle on NAFTA, hopefully next week or two. So, you know, it, it is doable. And I think both sides do want it. So I do think there's goodwill there. All right, we'll have to watch how that pans out, but at least Jamie Dimon seems confident. Let's move now to commodities, and Jesh Kilani joins in with all the details. Jesh, clearly oil is going to be in focus with that Iran deal uh, decision just around the corner. That's right, Alex. Uh, in fact, we understand that uh, Donald Trump is likely to announce uh, his decision as soon as, uh, uh, you know, as uh, 2 p.m., uh, 2 a.m. local time, which will be tomorrow for us. Uh, so on account of that, uh, we did see some uh, knee-jerk reaction come about for oil prices uh, slipped from the day's high. And in fact, uh, uh, today trading almost 1% uh, lower. Uh, so WTI is actually trading lower for after gaining for four sessions. And uh, also, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, the U.S. Uh, crude oil inventory data, which is likely to uh, spike up more than 1%. 1.2 million barrels for last week. Uh, so both, uh, you know, uh, keeping the market uh, on its edge, uh, and that's, that's the reason we're seeing some bit of downtick for oil prices. As far as base metals are concerned, no cues uh, came in from the London Metal Exchange uh, on account of a holiday. Uh, it was shut uh, because of that. And, uh, you know, if you look at the Shanghai Futures Exchange, most of these base metals are, in fact, trading with a mixed uh, view. Uh, zinc has gained uh, for the second day running and is up about 1-1.5%, uh, uh, while copper and steel are trading mildly negative. And we have aluminium, which is trading absolutely flat. Uh, but uh, what's important to note is the SGX iron ore prices which are currently trading 2% uh, lower. And this is the first time that we have seen uh, a red tick on SGX iron ore in last seven days. As far as precious metals are concerned, uh, we did see some a bit of a dip come about for gold futures on account, an, uh, on account of an advance in the dollar index that we have been talking about. All right, thanks for that, Chesh. Now, the big earnings to talk about uh, from last evening is, of course, ICICI Bank. Uh, the, the private sector lender's net profit halved, uh, mainly on account of a sharp rise in non-performing assets. That GNPA number, that bad loan number, has stopped just shy of the double-digit mark, and it's risen from eight, just about 8.5% uh, at the end of December. Shraddha Babla is here to tell you all about that. Shraddha, can you say that the numbers were more or less in line with estimates? There were actually quite a wide range uh, of estimates there. That's correct, uh, Alex. But more or less, they managed to meet that average Bloomberg consensus uh, number as far as the bottom line is concerned. And the good part is that there were no big surprises, or at least not a net loss for the quarter. So like you said, yes, the net profit half to about 1,020 crores. And that was largely on account of a small tax write back and also uh, one of gains of 3,200 crores coming in from the stake sale in ICICA Securities, which really saved the quarter uh, for ICICA Bank this time. Around. But even as the uh, on the business momentum front, uh, that continued to remain steady with the domestic loan growth inching up to 15%. That was mainly on account of a sharp 21% growth in the retail book. Deposits growth also continued to uh, grow at about 14% or so. But as far as the RBI circular is concerned, we saw an impact of nearly 10,000 crores. Uh, of addition uh, as far as the gross NPAs are concerned on account of that circular. So uh, the gross NP ratio uh, inched up to a near double-digit number of 9.90%. Slippage has jumped to 15,700 crores from 4,400 crores in the December quarter. The good part is that the watch list uh, was wound down by nearly 75% on a sequential basis from that 19,000 crore number to 4,700 crores. Uh, the bank, however, did manage to uh, do a good job as far as the recoveries and upgrades are concerned because uh, they were strong at 4,200 crores versus the number of 1,100 crores in the previous quarter. So they've uh, managed to do well there also and hence that has helped with respect to uh, the provisioning cover. Uh, with respect to NCLT exposure, 
you know why they did say that they haven't used the RBI dispensation on uh, spreading M to M losses. They did say that they have taken into account uh, the new. RBI dispensation which allows them to make a lower 40% provision cover as com uh, compared to 50% on the NCLT exposure. So uh, their NCLT uh, uh, exposures, the provision cover on them stood at just 50% uh, to at 7,600 crores at the end of the fourth quarter. The good part is that they have said that there was no requirement for divergence reporting for FY17 audit which means that the gross NP differential would be below 15%. Uh, on the video con matter, they said that there was no discussion in the board meeting and Chanda Kochar on stepping down did say that the board, board had already stated its stance on the matter and that they had nothing to add to that. Uh, the brokerages seem to have um, uh, taken it in positive light because overall the ratings have been kept unchanged while there are some minor uh, tweaks as far as target prices are concerned. So Credit Suisse has uh, reduced the target price by nearly 12% while there are minor two and a half, three percent price hikes coming in from Jeffries, Philip Securities, Prabhuda Sriladar and Motilal Oswal. But do listen in to what the management had to say on this video conish. One, the board has made its stand very clear. And the second is that ICSA Bank has always fully cooperated with all the regulatory and investigating agencies in any matter. And we would continue to cooperate. I see some of you online. I must remind you to let us know what you think, share, uh, like and comment. All right, let's move on. Nikki Manchandani is here with the stocks in news. Nikki, what are the stocks on your list today? Bunch of earnings and news that we're tracking this morning. To begin with Pfizer, extremely strong set of numbers reported by the company. Uh, if you look at the top line growth, it's a 19% uptick there at a number of 520 odd crore. Net profit has risen as much as 43% for this counter. This is on account of the healthy EBITDA performance that has been registered by the company. A 46% growth there at a number of 138 crore as compared to nearly 94.5 crore. Cost saving techniques and the decline in other expenses has led to uh, operationally strong performance for this company. JK Agri Generic, uh, Genetics, that's a relatively small cap, 500 crore kind of a uh, market capitalization company, but has reported extremely strong set of numbers. Uh, revenue has registered a jump of more than two and a half fold to a number of 51 crore as compared to 20 odd crore. Net profit, the company has reported net profit as compared to net loss. This is on back of healthy EBITDA show where the company even on operating level has posted a profitability of 10.5 crore as compared to a loss of nearly 7 crore in the corresponding quarter of the previous year. Trident, that's a weak show there. Uh, top line growth remains muted, down as much as 6% and uh, even the EBITDA, that's almost an uptick of 3% but then the net profit has taken a hit down as much as 49% for this counter on back of uh, the kind of adjustment that we've seen in other income where uh, the company in the base quarter has reported a 52 crore uh, other income as compared to a negative uh, expense that we've seen in the income side. Uh, Tata Coffee on consolidated basis, that's a weak show on the counter. Revenue up by 9%. EBITDA has come down for this counter as much as 67%, uh, which in turn has weighed down on the bottom line performance of the company. In bunch of news that we're tracking this morning, we're expecting some kind of temporary blip to come in for Tata Metallics, given that the operation at Kargapur plant has been uh, halted for now due to some issue uh, with regards to the work, worker unions. Unicum Laboratories, that's uh, another, uh, that's one of the farmer stocks that we're tracking this morning. It's on back of the company receiving an ENDA approval, uh, approval for hypertension drug. Uh, also Lupin again is expected to remain in uh, focus because uh, on account of the USFDA approval for an inf uh, inflammatory relief ointment, the sale of which is to the tune of 120 odd million dollar. PNB housing shareholder uh, are uh, seeking to raise $153 million in emplacement. We are expecting some sort of reaction coming in this, on this counter, at least a negative one, because the shareholder is looking to sell as much as $8 million equity share, which is a roughly 5% stake for a sum of around, for a, uh, for a sum of around $1,280 per share, which implies a 9% discount to the current market price. All right. Thanks for that, Nikki. Now, Somit Sarkar is here with the big brokerage calls of the day. Somit, you have a couple of them to tell us about. 
Uh, yes, Alex, good morning first. So on the big brokerage calls first we have is IFL on General Stainless. Now they have initiated coverage on the stock with a buy rating and a target price of 107. Now according to the brokerage, the company will further enhance its utilization levels which will drive the volume growth for the company. Along with this, the company is also looking to expand its downstream facilities. Now this will bo boost the incremental revenue and profits for the company. However, the margins would marginally dip because of the expansion plans according to the brokerage. Now the brokerage is also expecting the company's volume a bit and net profit to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 11%, 9% and 25% over FI18 to FI20. Also steady ramp up in utilizations and improvement in profitability and cash flows will, will aid the company to exit from the corporate debt restructuring scheme. According to the brokerage, the company's balance sheet is also improving as healthy cash generation would drive deleveraging of the balance sheet. Lastly, it says that the valuations are attractive for general stainless. Second, we have a Scotex Securities on Mother Sumi. Now, the brokerage has maintain its sell rating with a target price of 265. Now, the brokerage has analyzed the financials of Madhasan Sumi along with its international peers and it says that the Madhasan's EBIT growth is in line with peers. Now, Madhasan's EBIT grew at a compounded annual growth rate of 11% over the last three years while that of its peers at close to 10%. However, the return ratios, that is the return on equity and return on capital employed is significantly inferior to that of its peers due to comparative, comparatively low operating margins and higher working capital requirements for Madhasan Sumi. Now, investors believe that the company will report superior growth but according to the brokerage, this has been already priced in. And lastly, it sees that Madhasan Sumi trades at double valuation compared to its peers is, is not uh, the, and the valuation is not justified because it has already been priced in. All right, Swami, thanks for that. Now, there's clearly lots to talk about, right, from the markets to the international crude prices, the Iran deal uh, that will happen at the end uh, of uh, today, in fact, overnight. Uh, and you'll find all of that on the website BloombergQuint.com. But there are several stories that are currently there and that you can read. First up, a five-judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court will today hear a plea filed by Congress party leaders challenging the rejection of an impeachment motion filed against Chief Justice of India, Deepak Mishra. The DSP group will buy out BlackRock's 40% stake in, joint in, it, in their joint venture, DSP BlackRock Investment Managers. The deal is subject to regulatory approval. All right, now you've all heard of the board game Monopoly and it's been around for a while. Uh, I'm sure that your family still love playing it. But did you know that the game has a remarkable history that dates back to the early 20th century? And believe it or not, it has anti-capitalist roots. Check it out. The design of this board game started in 1904 with a woman named Elizabeth McGee. She was a fan of a book called Progress and Poverty by economist Henry George. In it, he argued that renting out land only profited a few individuals at the expense of the community. To teach people about George's theories, Lizzie McGee created a game with two sets of rules. In one, players all shared money when someone purchased a piece of land, and in the other, everyone tried to get as rich as possible while bankrupting others. This way, she hoped people would see how unfair land grabbing was. The landlord's game, as it was known, became popular, particularly among Quakers, with each person drawing the board by hand onto tablecloths or fabric and modifying the rules. One of those people was Charles Darrow. He would only use the rules that were cutthroat and made a version of the board in the shape of his dining table. He also took street names from Atlantic City, grouping them by color and adding small illustrations to create the board we know today. When Parker Brothers bought the rights to Monopoly from Darrow in 1935, they soon added a portly mascot with a top hat and cane, rumored to be modeled on wealthy banker J.P. Morgan. They also distributed every set with metal tokens, inspired by trinkets Darrow had used from his niece's charm bracelet. Within a year of the release, 35,000 copies of Monopoly were being made each week. Now more than 1 billion people in 114 countries have played the game. Classic and familiar, this is the design that set out to make us work together, but has been dividing families ever since. Well, I certainly remember all the fights that I've had playing Monopoly. On that note, that's all we have for you on Daybreak. But up next is all you need to know. Thanks for watching. This is Bloomberg Quint.